would like to start this talk by acknowledging the Turrbal and Yagra people, the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking this afternoon. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. In my presentation, we will be looking at a systematic implementation of prevention strategies today for a safer operating theatre tomorrow. For today's presentation, we're going to look at how staff safety was addressed during the initial part of the COVID-19 pandemic, what lessons were missed from the pandemic and previous pandemics, as well as how we can use the hierarchy of controls as a systematic framework to improve staff safety in the future, to protect staff from respiratory infections and other hazards in the operating theatre. We will finish by looking at how the three levels of responsibility for implementing that change, namely national, organisational and personal or individual, can work together. As you can see from this timeline, the COVID-19 outbreak was officially identified in December 2019 when the first case was reported. In March of 2020, the World Health Organisation officially declared it a pandemic and six months later, the first 1 million deaths were reported. In December 2020, 12 months after the first infection, vaccinations started. The World Health Organization estimates by May 2021 that over 180,000 healthcare workers have died from COVID. The current estimates of global infections are 510 million cases and 6.2 million deaths. And both these figures are believed to be gross underestimates. For example, a recent WHO report stated that the number of deaths is nearly 15 million people. Let's start by looking at the consequences of the immediate response to this health crisis being so heavily focused on personal protective equipment. The first highly visible response by governments and hospitals to the COVID-19 pandemic was the increased use of PPE, in particular gloves, gowns and masks. Practically, this initial response was designed to reduce the spread of COVID both within the hospitals and in the community. Another reason for the early focus on personal protective equipment was that it was easy to implement rapidly, until of course the stocks ran out. And in theory, they were supposed to act as a stopgap measure to buy time for more effective control measures to be introduced. However, what the general population heard was, PPE is the be-all and end-all for staff safety. They were not educated about the need for more effective control measures to be implemented as soon as possible, nor were they educated on the fact that preventative measures should have been implemented prior to the outbreak. So what have the impacts of the initial PPE response to the COVID pandemic been? The sudden, almost simultaneous global increase in demand for PPE led to a dramatic supply chain breakdown and this resulted in the use of lower quality and even fake certified products. It also increased the cost of PPE, all leading to a lack of protection for healthcare workers. We saw increased costs and decreased revenues to hospitals with elective surgery being cancelled for varying periods in all states and territories. We saw increased anxiety for staff and patients and decreased wellbeing for both. Increased sharps injuries to staff were also observed and reported in European studies. I think we can all agree that our response to this pandemic was not perfect. And this was largely because the lessons that we should have learned from previous epidemics and pandemics were ignored. So now is the right time to learn from the successes and failures of the response to this current pandemic and see how we can better prepare for the inevitable future ones. Let's go back 40 years to the HIV AIDS pandemic that has killed at least 32 and a half million people. The first cases in healthcare workers were reported in 1985, but it was 15 years before the first law to protect staff from infection was passed in the USA, namely the 2000 Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act. In Europe, it was a total of 28 years before similar legislation was passed. And sadly, 37 years later, Australia still doesn't have equivalent legislation to protect staff from sharps injuries. For those of you who are lucky not to be old enough to remember the early days of the HIV pandemic, I can tell you that the amount of fear and even hysteria at that time was very similar to what we have experienced recently. 
Now let's go back less than 20 years to the SARS epidemic, which was also caused by coronavirus. Did we really learn the lessons we were being taught back then? Research groups that were working on a vaccine against coronavirus during SARS had their funding cut when normality was restored. This meant that their research was shelved. A great example of how not to plan for a safer future. As you can see on this slide, we have had plenty of opportunity to learn and implement strategies to protect clinical staff from hazards, including those resulting from bloodborne and respiratory infections. So why were we so underprepared? To put it nicely, the evidence strongly suggests that it is very likely to be something other than a lack of knowledge. At a national level, politics would appear to have played a big role, and I don't mean that in any partisan way, especially on election day. Short-term political focus on budgets and the next election makes it difficult to invest in preventative strategies, even when there is good evidence that this will lead to money being saved in the medium to long term. In the US, the UK and many other Western countries, funding cuts were made to biosurveillance and public health, with focus being shifted to more tangible threats, such as national security. Australia's last large-scale pandemic exercise was run in 2008. At an organisational level, training for public health emergency preparedness and response was grossly underdone. There also remains a short-term focus on balancing budgets and patient safety. Staff safety remains a poor second cousin in their priorities, especially when it comes to resource allocation. And historically, we as clinicians have just accepted this. Organisations have taken a silent bet in preparing for likely events and hoping that the unlikely ones won't occur, at least not on their watch. Obviously, this was not a winning bet. At an individual level, there is a lot of denial about staff safety risk which is understandable when many staff, especially the younger ones, have no personal experience with similar pandemic events, or more accurately, no personal experience with friends and colleagues dying during those epidemics and pandemics. As you will be able to testify, almost all jobs are so busy that it feels like there is no free time for anyone to spend training for remote events that may never occur. So not learning from the past and relying too heavily on personal protective equipment has led to the following consequences. Firstly, hospitals are not focused on more effective prevention strategies. Planned strategies to prevent respiratory infections should have already been implemented. Other occupational risks seem to have been ignored. In fact, Sharps injuries amongst nurses have increased during the pandemic. The Royal College of Nurses in the UK found that Sharps injuries increased in 2020 by 50% compared with 2008. They noted that the reasons included increased staff pressure and fatigue, as well as lack of access to safer sharps and appropriate training and education. Along with this, staff safety culture was impacted. Fatigue increased and wellness decreased. Okay, so what are we going to do better this time? We need to invest in a systematic approach to prevention, rather than rely on an inferior ad hoc reactive approach. We will now look at how to implement a systematic approach to prevention in order to avoid the negative impacts that we have experienced when the response was limited to PPE. To start with, how can we ensure that more effective control measures are implemented at the right time to prevent current and future respiratory infections? The hierarchy of controls provides us with an effective framework to identify when more effective control measures can be implemented in hospitals to look at prevention in a systematic way. The hierarchy of controls dates back to 1950 when they were developed by the National Safety Council in America. They took an upside down approach to the behaviour based safety programs that ignored hazards and risks and focused on critical worker behaviour. The old way of dealing with staff safety relied heavily on elaborate mechanisms to check, inspect, observe, coach and reward and even discipline workers. Over the last 70 years the hierarchy of controls has been standardised across most industries to reduce risk in a systematic, system-wide manner. Healthcare is finally reviewing and adopting this proven approach. Use of the hierarchy of controls is now recommended by many globally respected institutions in healthcare, including but not limited to the World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, OSHA, NIOSH and ARN in the US, the NHS in the UK and in the European Council Directors. 
In Australia, they are recommended in the Workplace Safety Act and our National Safety and Quality Health Service Standards. The hierarchy of control is divided into five levels, elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE. It provides you with a structured and simple way to analyze and manage any occupational risk. The top control measures are the most effective and the bottom ones are the least effective. Let me present details on how these different levels can be applied to prevent the risks of respiratory infections, both in normal times and during future pandemics and epidemics, like the COVID one we are still in now. Elimination or removal of the hazard, in this case, people infected with COVID, is obviously the best way of reducing infections to staff and other patients. There are a variety of ways to achieve this. In the operating theatre, one can pre-test patients and staff prior to surgery, reschedule COVID positive patients and replace COVID positive staff. Just as importantly for the operating theatre are the control measures for the general hospital, such as not admitting COVID infected patients with minor symptoms and admitting sicker patients to special wards where they can still receive optimal medical care, but they will be safely isolated from staff and other patients keeping visitor numbers to an absolute minimum, quarantining staff and using telehealth when practical. Substitution or replacement of the hazard with a safer alternative is another excellent way of reducing respiratory infections. Examples in the operating theatre include using video laryngoscopy for intubations. This allows distance between the anaesthetist and anaesthetic nurse and a patient's nasopharyngeal secretions and in the general hospital using spaces instead of nebulizers when treating asthmatic patients with Ventolin. Rarely are elimination and substitution strategies completely sufficient to protect staff from the hazard. This is when the next level, which is engineering controls, plays a significant role. Engineering controls are designed to further protect people from the hazard by creating a change to the workers' environment. As you will see from the following examples, engineering controls cover a wide range of solutions, from the original hospital design to expensive capital equipment and to less expensive disposable safety devices. Examples in the operating theatre include negative pressure operating theatres with HEPA filters and external exhaust systems, and smoke evacuation systems and vacuum shrouds. And in the general hospital, patient isolation rooms with negative pressure and HEPA filters physical barriers, barriers and dedicated pathways to guide symptomatic patients through triage areas, plexiglass screens and hands-free bins, soap dispensers and door openers. The next step is administrative controls. Administrative controls are essentially there to ensure that staff change the way they work and that they actually implement the hierarchy of control solutions that were already agreed upon. Examples in the OT include ensuring physical distancing measures are in place, providing training on new policies and hand hygiene practices, and minimising the number of healthcare workers in theatres. Similarly, in the general hospital, employee training on the use of PPE, including dons and doffs. Signage is another example, for example, where to stand and reminders on how to perform hand hygiene correctly. Reviewing disinfection practices, especially in patient use areas staggering work schedules for staff arrival and departure to reduce physical congestion at those times and during meal breaks. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, is probably the most universally identified way of keeping staff safe. However, it sits at the bottom of the upside down pyramid for a reason. It is the least effective way of protecting staff from respiratory infections. Examples in the operating theatre include fit tested respirators, gloves, gowns and eye protection such as face shields and in the general hospital the list is pretty much the same. It is important to stress that PPE should be used in conjunction with the higher levels of control never as a substitution for the higher levels. This slide is a summary of our very recent EORNA presentation. We basically looked at the theatre control measures as identified by Alvino and Corgill in 2020. Most of these measures have been discussed earlier. We then looked at these measures and grouped them by the hierarchy's five levels and recorded how well they have been implemented. In the last column, we assigned an arbitrary score as demonstrated by the faces. 
The elimination strategies appear to have been done relatively well and substitution, administrative controls and PPE were done adequately. However, when it comes to engineering controls, the implementation of these measures seems to have been done poorly, as you can see by the sad, embarrassed red face. This is probably due to a greater upfront cost of engineering controls for hospitals who are often hesitant to invest in prevention. It should be acknowledged that scores in different countries and even individual hospitals in the same state or city could have varied widely. We will discuss how the hierarchy of controls can be used to prevent Sharps injuries in more details in the next few slides. In light of this scorecard, we will now look at a second example of using a systematic approach to keep staff safe. And please remember, a safe culture needs to be applied across the board. It must cover all the risks. It must protect both staff and patients. There are still 18,500 Sharps injuries occurring annually in Australian hospitals. There are 385,000 Sharps injuries in the USA and a million in Europe. And despite all the education on Sharps injuries and staff safety, it is estimated that 50% of all injuries still go unreported. It's no wonder that the 2013 Public Citizen Report described healthcare as a high hazard workplace. Please have a quick look at this pie chart indicating where Sharps injuries occur in the hospital. They occur in all areas and affect all categories of staff, with 40% occurring in the operating theatre. As I said earlier, one safety culture must be applied across the board 24 hours a day and it must cover all risks. Now when one considers that Sharps injuries across the hospital have reduced by 30%, this should be taken as proof that injury prevention can be achieved. However, it should prompt immediate questions about why we seem to have accepted a 6.5% rise in Sharps injuries in the operating theatre. Having identified Sharps injuries in the OT as an ongoing problem, we will look at using the same proven hierarchy of controls framework to reduce them. Elimination is obviously the best way of reducing Sharps injuries when it is a possibility. By way of examples, non-essential intravenous and intramuscular injections need to be stopped. The medications need to be given as oral or transdermal formulations as soon as possible. And for appropriate wounds, glue should be used in preference to sutures. Substitution is another excellent way of reducing Sharps injuries. Examples include the almost universal introduction of needle-free intravenous access systems. Surgeons should also use blunt tip suture needles for closing muscle and fascia. However, in many cases, elimination or substitution of a sharp is not physically possible, such as the need for scalpels to be used during surgery. In these cases, we need to look at the next level or levels in the hierarchy of controls to determine the best ways to prevent these injuries, starting with engineering controls. As was explained earlier, engineering controls are designed to further protect staff from the hazard by creating a change to the worker's environment rather than relying wholly on changing worker behaviour. Engineering controls to prevent Sharps injuries and cuts include devices that are specifically designed with a safety feature to protect the user from injury. An example would be a retractable syringe or a single-handed scalpel blade remover and even a Sharps container. Kelly grips and artery forceps, on the other hand, don't meet this requirement. It is worth noting that not all safety devices are the same. Passive safety devices are ones where the action is automatically activated with no extra action being required by the user. By contrast, active safety devices are ones in which the user must manually activate the safety mechanism, meaning these devices are prone to human error. Not surprisingly, recent studies show that active safety devices are involved in up to 70 times more injuries than passive safety devices. Before I move on from engineering controls, I would like to point out the NHMRC's Australian Guidelines for the Prevention and Control of Infection in Healthcare. This now refers to the need to use safety devices, such as single-handed scalpel blade removers, with preference to passive or automatic safety devices over active or manual safety devices, and the need for immediate containment of the sharp to prevent injury to downstream staff. The NH and MRC guidelines now also reference the Australian standard AS3825 2020. 
procedures and devices for the removal, containment and disposal of scalpel blades from the scalpel handles. This standard should be consulted when you are developing your staff safety policies and procedures, which will be part of the next step. The next step is administrative controls. Examples include a sharp safety program with written policies and guidelines congruent with the Work Health and Safety Act and the Australian Guidelines for the Prevention and Control of Infection in Healthcare. Measures to ensure compliance with safe work practices including vaccination of all staff, sharps injury incident reporting processes, use of the neutral zone, no recapping, and implementation of a sharps safety training program for all staff exposed to sharps. Personal protective equipment or PPE is probably the most universally identified way of keeping staff safe. Examples of PPE for staff handling sharps may include double gloving and protective footwear. PPE should also be provided to workers outside the operating theatre, for example, waste collection and laundry staff. As we have seen before, PPE is the option of last resort, the last line of defence. The first four levels need to be given greater importance and need to be implemented in conjunction with PPE, not replaced by PPE. We will now look at the third and final systematic approach to reduce and prevent hazards namely by supporting both staff and patient safety culture. Investing in staff safety is important for two reasons. In its own right, as an ethical prerogative, and because this also has a positive flow-on effect to patient safety. For this reason, we have been advocating for many years for healthcare to adopt one single safety culture for both staff and patients. If there can be such a thing as a silver lining from this past horrific two and a half years or so, it has been the public spotlight on the need to keep healthcare workers safe. In fact, a quotation from a 2020 Lancet article states it clearly, there now needs to be universal recognition that health worker safety is patient safety. One cannot exist without the other. Similarly, the World Health Organization made the 2021 theme for World Patient Safety Day keep healthcare workers safe to keep patients safe. The good news is that our nurses are now adopting and demonstrating for improved staff and patient safety. On the left, we see local protests by nurses in New South Wales for improved nursing ratios to improve patient safety. On the right, we see an example of nurses all around the world demonstrating the need for their safety to be taken more seriously. This is true for respiratory infections, sharp infections, exposure to surgical plume and musculoskeletal injuries, etc. Now, the first step of accepting that the problem exists is underway. We need to look at the responsibilities for designing and implementing the solutions. Preparation for future pandemics needs to start today and it needs to be based on a systematic approach to hazard reduction, exploring potential solutions at all five levels of the hierarchy of controls. Development and implementation of these potential solutions must be supported, promoted and implemented at these three levels, national, organisational and individual. In the next three slides, we will remind ourselves of the basic ingredients that must be followed for the required change to happen. At a national level, we need to see the following. Firstly, our governments need to adjust their budgets and invest in long-term prevention strategies. They and we need to align staff and patient safety standards, including those for infection control. By conducting regular, large-scale national pandemic exercises, we can both practice what needs to be done, review and improve the original processes, as well as incorporate the most successful ones into day-to-day -day clinical practice. Adequate resources and equipment need to be allocated. Programs to support innovation should be budgeted for, and public awareness for patient safety and staff safety concerns need to be increased. Some major cultural thinking processes need to change at the organisational level to prevent a recurrence of the devastation of this pandemic. I trust the information presented in this talk has convinced you that one of the first steps needs to be organisations investing in higher levels of control measures to prevent over-reliance of PPE. And this should go hand in hand with the provision of realistic, comprehensive training for emergencies, 
by running high fidelity simulations and establishing an organisational approach to the prevention of injuries and infections by creating systems for analysing risks, both common and novel, reporting hazards and injuries, conducting root cause analysis and timely corrective actions. I hope you've had a chance to listen to my colleague Chimindika Conner's presentation this morning. It is one of the best talks I've ever heard on root cause analysis. Back to the slide. And reviewing innovations inside and outside healthcare. At an individual level, you need to speak up about problems you encounter and potential solutions you come up with. The national level can fund the R&D, legislate the introduction of change and publish, publish audits of progress. The organisation can fund your safety devices, audit compliance with stipulated behaviour and environmental changes and make participation more engaging and rewarding for you. But I think it is up to you and I to take our safety seriously and to use the safety devices provided. You and I need to utilise evidence-based practices. Participate when risk analysis or CAPA investigations are being run. We need to advocate for and take part in pandemic preparedness simulations and occupational safety training. Please speak up if you have an idea or innovation which can improve safety in your facility. I would like to thank my co-authors, Dr. Chimindika Conora, who has a PhD in biotechnology, and Meryn Montes, who has a degree in communication, for their assistance in preparing this presentation. Please see my email address, and I invite you to write to us with your feedback, questions, and ideas for how we can make the future safer for both ourselves and our patients. Thank you for your time.